Tesla has a unique advantage when it comes to making self-driving cars a reality, but it might not be what you think. Stay tuned. The person who has the biggest data set is ultimately going to win. Now I hear a lot of people in the media talk about self-driving cars like they're already here, like I can go get in one right now. They throw around terms like artificial intelligence or AI, machine learning, deep learning, uh, computer vision, and all kinds of other things, and I'm not sure they really know what they're talking about. I've been in tech for almost 20 years and I'm not sure I know either. I wanted to learn more about these, so I called up friend, fellow online author, data geek, and also doctor of computer vision. He literally has a PhD in this, Dr. Satya Malik, and thought I would ask him uh, to explain it to me a little bit. So AI is, you can think about AI is conceptually the biggest, you know, it's, it's like a biggest circle. It uh, has everything inside it. So the field started roughly in the 1960s where uh, the idea was that can you make computers do things that humans do. So earlier, before that, people were thinking of computers as advanced calculators, right? You punch yeah. in some numbers, it uh, does something. Now the idea was to replicate human intelligence using computers. Can a computer think like a human? Uh, and for that, it needs to work on things that it, it has not seen before. That was the main difference. In case of regular programming, you know, the data, you know what the data is, you know what the output should be, and uh, it just applies. It's a forward problem in some sense. In case of AI, you're solving, a lot of times you're solving the inverse problem. So I'm looking at you, I don't know who you are, face recognition, it is the inverse problem, right? In computer graphics also, it is the forward problem. So you want to generate the scene from a structure, right? In computer vision, it is the inverse problem. So AI was this idea: how can you um, how can you replicate human intelligence using a computer? And the difference between and at that time it was not clear what should you do, right? Mm -hmm. Do you come up with a set of rules, or do you collect a lot of data, mm -hmm. right? And the thing that has won out is that you cannot come up with enough rules to model everything. Right. There are just too many rules. So what they came up with is, what, what if we come up with a data-driven approach, right? So that you're also t taking away the expert from, when, when it was rule-based, an expert had to say that this is the right rule to apply. But when it is a data-driven approach, there is no expert required, right? You just collect the data uh, and let the machine learn from the data. Mm -hmm. And nobody's telling the machine yeah, you know, this is important. There is some, some of that, but not, uh, not explicitly cooking up the rules. So machine learning is when you try to learn from the data, when the machine learns from the data. Now, so that's a smaller uh, set, right? AI was the bigger set where you could, nobody knew. It is silent on how you solve the problem, right? It just had to replicate human intelligence or solve like humans, but it was silent on how you do it. Machine learning is you do it using data, right? So it's saying, uh, data is the way to go. And then computer vision is, again, a subset of machine learning, or they are overlapping in some sense, where you are saying that images, it concerns visual data, right? So there is speech uh, and other things, but computer vision only deals with visual images and videos. Mm -hmm. um, and in computer vision, it's, it's not a perfect overlap, like it's not a subset of machine learning. Mm -hmm. There is overlapping area because when you build panoramas using pictures, that's also computer vision. Mm. So anything you want to do, either extract data from images mm -hmm. or combine uh, data in images in interesting ways, they're all computer vision. Yeah, so <laughs> that brings us to deep learning. Now, deep learning is um, essentially, so in machine learning, there are many different ways of solving the problem. And one of the ways is using neural networks. And the way to think about neural networks is, think about it as a black box. Now inside the neural network, there are various layers. And layers, each layer tries to understand a level of abstraction of the image. So now, there are more than, whenever you have more than one layer, it is called a deep neural network, because it is more than one. But these days, you can have hundreds of layers. So the state of the art, and that's what deep learning is. It's a neural network with 
hundreds of layers. All right, that makes sense. So you have AI, which is the field, and then within that you have machine learning, and computer vision, the part where we teach a computer how to see, is kind of a subset of that, but also has some other components. So it's more like an overlapping circle thing. Kind of like how there's beer, and then there's ales and lagers, and then there's IPAs and stouts and those kind of things. So it's just a hierarchy here of terms, but they do seem to be thrown around quite a bit. So the goal is to teach a computer how to see, to give it vision, but how does that work exactly? Here's Satya again. So 2012, uh, in 2010 actually, the story begins in 2010. Researchers at Stanford, they released, and in collaboration with Google, they released this huge data set called ImageNet. Now, ImageNet was, it had more than a million images at that time, now it's way more than that, and 1,000 different classes. So cats, dogs, each of them is a class, cats, dogs, table, chair, etc. And they had 1,000 different classes and more than a million different images. Now, when this data set was released, uh, because there are 1,000 different classes, you can imagine that the accuracy would be, if you take a random guess, is one over 1,000, right? That is the accuracy. But, um, so they made the problem slightly simpler. They said that you just need to get it in the top five. You have five guesses, if you're in the top five, you're good, right? Uh, so that level of accuracy in 2010, when the competition was released, uh, it was 74, 72%, I believe, yeah. Uh, so 72% accuracy, pretty good. I mean, impressive, uh, because at that time it was uh, mind blowing. In 2011, there was an incremental uh, progress, right? So from 72%, I believe we went to 74%. Um, and that's how you expect technology uh, to uh, you know, progress. Uh, one, two percent every year, and in 10 years, you are you know, 18, 90%, whatever. But in 2012, the second entry was you know, 75% or something like that, which is in line with what we had seen. The first entry was 85%, 85%. It's like, it's like humiliating to others, right? It's like Hussein Bolt <laughs> looking over his shoulders uh, to, to see who's coming behind or how far uh, they are. All right, things are becoming a bit more clear. And as you guessed it, the key to this whole thing is having enough data to teach the computer what it's actually looking at. One of the toughest parts, however, is telling the computer what it's actually seeing so that way it understands how to learn from that. Now Satya has an idea about how Tesla here may have a unique advantage. In self-driving cars, the data is automatically labeled in some cases. Not all, you know, there is automatic labeling. For example, you're driving and uh, the, the car is, uh, you know, the cameras are monitoring you press the brake hard. It tells you there was something wrong and you combine this data. Yeah, you, you, when you're driving, the steering wheel data tells you that there is a curvature and so you can combine all this data and it can uh, be very, very uh, useful. So by recording what the car is actually seeing while it drives and then recording the person's reactions to that, Tesla is in really good shape when it comes to getting enough data to truly make a self-driving car. But Satya thinks that there's something else that gives them an edge here. Okay, now coming back to uh, Google and Tesla, they, in case of Tesla, they are taking one step at a time. So they are saying that we may not go to completely uh, drive, like hands-free mode, but we will go in steps. First, it will be assistive, you know, you can, uh, take off your hands on highways and stuff like that. And I believe that's, that's a very nice approach and that's probably the right approach for any company, car company like Tesla. All right, so that's it, right? Tesla has the data. They obviously have a great team of engineers, but data is the key ingredient here, of course. Why isn't it here? Why can't I go out and get in my car and just tell it where to go? Why do I have to be burdened by using my hands to steer the car? It doesn't make any sense. Well, as you may have guessed, humans will, we get in the way. So I think Victor Hugo or somebody said that nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. <laughs> so it's very difficult, very, very difficult to stop uh, this, this juggernaut, right? It is going to uh, happen. Uh, the risks could be, uh, it's, it's very difficult to imagine something that would completely stop it, right? It could be the legal problems that, okay, uh, 
because it's only 99.99% and that last 1.001%, uh, it takes us much longer than expected, right? Instead of saying, uh, you know, instead of it taking uh, five years, it takes uh, 20, 30, 40 years. So it's still, then it doesn't become legal because you know about that risk, which is greater than uh, human risk. Right, and it doesn't need to be even greater than human risk. Even if it is doing better than humans in, on an average, that's not enough. Because in one case, you can blame the human. In the other case, you cannot blame the human and that, uh, that's a ethical issue in some sense. Like I said, humans getting in the way again. And to our future robot overlords, remember I was on your side from the beginning. So what's next? What will the future look like? Will we even need roads? Roads. Where we're going, we don't need roads. For example, when uh, a vast majority of cars are driverless, or let's say 100% of the cars are driverless, do you need traffic signals, mm. right? Because they can be communicating with each other and going in fleets instead of a single vehicle, right? They could all be moving together. And even if it's partially driverless, right? So half the people are driver, uh, driverless and half the people are not then if you know that the car in front of you is driverless, these guys can communicate, the light turns green, they all move together instead of, you know, right yeah. now there is a cascade. Wow, I think this is gonna be an exciting future and I hope you guys are excited about it too. The whole fleet thing, not having stoplights, potentially not having parking lots, all this is great. But until then, I guess I'm gonna have to rough it with autopilot. So what do you think? Are self-driving cars going to be a boon for our economy and our society? Is it going to save millions of lives? Or is this just another thing that is kind of science fiction? I'm really curious. Leave me a comment down below. And if you like this video, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. If you're new here, consider subscribing. Each week what we do is we break down the data behind Tesla in all the other ways that it's changing our world. So if you like that kind of thing, join us. And remember, when you free the data, your mind will follow. Thanks for watching.